All right. So we'll scroll down, scroll down to day five. Look how far we've come. We've done a lot. Go to data cleaning. All right. So data cleaning is not something that's considered super glamorous, but it's super vital and critical for performing analyses correctly. Um, and so it's an, a, very, a very important topic and R does a great job with it. So if you take nothing else away from this lecture, take this away, which is it's really important to look at your data and make sure that things are coded correctly, that things aren't coded multiple ways. This does happen, that there aren't typos and other errors and inaccuracies. Um, you know, take, take a deep dive into your data. So one thing that's super important to pay attention to is missing data. And you're most likely going to see NA values, which we've already seen and talked about a bit. Um, and that just stands for generally missing data. There's also NAN, which you'll sometimes come across, which is not a number. This might happen if you're doing certain mathematical um, operations like zero divided by zero. There's also infinite, infinity and negative infinity. Again, this happens when you do certain mathematical operations. Um, so just wanted you to make aware, be aware of uh, those other options. If you wanted to check whether your data has these um, missing types of data, there's functions for each of them. There's one called is NA, as well as is NAN, um, and is infinite which checks for both negative and positive. And these are logical functions, so they'll return a value of true. Um, and they need a vector, so this would be, you would have to pull your uh, variable if you're working with a data frame. All right, so here's some examples using isNA, which is one of the most common that you might use. Um, so if you already have a vector, in this case, our data objects are vectors. Um, and then the first one here, we see that A has an NA value and B does not have an NA value. Uh, if we run is NA, it would give us a whole, um, it would give us a true and false value for each element of our vector. Um, so we would get false, 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 true. But the any function is going to tell us of all of this list of trues and falses, are there any that are true? So that's what the any function in front of is na is going to do. And indeed, it tells us that yes, there is a value that is na. Um, however, with b, we do not have any na values. So when we run is na, when we run any, we get a value of false. There's also the exclamation mark, which we can use um, to negate or get the opposite value. Um, so just to show you this, I'm actually just gonna copy this because it's faster. Mm. Okay, don't worry about that warning for now. Um, here we have our A values, um, which are what we expect. Um, and if we try to run is an, oops, is an A around A, not, oh, there's a typo. There we go. So like I told you, there is actually indeed a string for there's, it gives us a logical output for each value. And so when we use any, it's just saying across all of those, is there any value that's NA? So the any function can be used outside of this context as well. But sometimes you have, and often as we see, we're gonna be using a data frame. Um, and so it's nice to have other ways of doing this. The Nannier function, um, which is, the guy that developed it apparently named it this based on his love for Narnia. 
And so it has to do with Nans and Narnia, and that's why it's called Nannier. Um, but anyway, uh, I would recommend checking out the package. This is a link here to some information about it. Um, it has a lot of functions that we can use to get a sense of our data um, in a faster way. And so one function that I think is especially helpful is this one called percent complete um, or PCT underscore complete, which shows the amount that is complete for a given um, data object or, or um, vector. Um, it's telling you the amount that does not have any NA value. So by complete here, we mean not NA. Um, and so if we, and you would need to install this package using install packages Nannier if you don't yet have it, and then you would need to load it. Um, so if we had this vector here, um, we would see that it's 85, close to 86% complete because we have one NA value. Um, and if you were using um, a data frame, you could also use this on a variable, which we'll see in a second. Uh, no, yeah, you do not use, need to use a matrix. You can use a data frame. Um, generally, R does treat blank fields as an NA, but you should check your data. There are some cases where it might not catch things, so always take a look. But yeah, if you're reading it in, it's going to try to coerce your data especially if you're trying to read it in as a data frame, it's going to try to have it have this, the correct dimensions where every um, column is the same length. So that's a good question. Um, so here we're in fact going to try now with a data frame, we're gonna technically use a Tibble uh, version of a data frame. So we're gonna use the air quality data, uh, which comes automatically with R, which is about air quality measurements from New York City in 1973. Um, so that's some old data, but it's still useful. Um, and if you wanted to find out more information, you could use the question air quality. And you'll see here that in my help um, tab, I now have information about this data set and what each of the columns mean. So that's a very useful thing to do. Um, but if I make this into a tibble, because I like tibbles and I like seeing the information, in this case, this is a nice time to see that we have, as a review, integers, which are whole numbers for some of our columns. And we have um, variables that are double, which have our extra precision. So they have decimal or fractional values. So we could actually use it on the entire data frame or tibble and get information that 95% of the, the tibble is complete. So, oops, things like that, or um, see what was our, Oh, I would need to pull it because it likes um, vectors. There we go. So this is how you could run it for each variable that you might be interested in. But you don't even have to do that because there's some really great options for visualizing your data um, in this package, one of them being GG miss variable. So this is, stands for grammar of graphics. We'll be talking a lot about that later for visualizations. So one of the most important packages for creating visualizations is called ggplot. So that's why this is called gg. And then, you know, missing variable. So when we run this, we see um, an output like this. It has our variables on the y-axis and then the number of missing values for each of those variables. So we can see that the ozone variable is um, particularly showing a lot of missing values.
Um, so just as a brief overview, we, we would want to use group by to get the day information, use the summarize function, which Ava introduced to us yesterday, name the output of what we were, what we would be creating with summarize, something that makes sense, and then uh, use the sum function to figure out what the sum of all the different boardings were for each day. Um, and of course, try to make sure we avoid issues with NA values. So that's how we would do that one, in case you were wondering. And we'll update the, the files online. OK, so scan that again. why it's excited about my graphics, but don't worry about that. Um, okay. So moving on to our, our ggness variable, and we were just seeing how powerful this function is to create this really nice plot automatically. We don't have to do anything else. Um, just run this, this simple function around a whole data frame or a vector of a variable from a data frame, and we'll get um, information from, from this. Oh, actually, I haven't ever tried this on a, a single variable, because what would be the point, really? Um, well, maybe there's a reason, but I <laughs> would use percent complete on that. But yeah, um, the great thing about uh, the percent complete one is that it works on a, on a data frame or if you pull a variable, so either way. Um, so another nice feature, which we'll be talking about when we get to more information about visualizations is something called faceting. So it means, you know, that we'll have multiple plots or multiple viewpoints. And so, um, we can run the same function that we just did creating the GG miss variable plot on the air quality data. But in this case, we're going to also add this argument for facet, and we're going to facet by a variable called month, which is uh, the numeric values for the day, the months of the year. And this is really useful because we can see much a much better idea, get a much better idea of why we're seeing these NA values for ozone. And they're mostly coming from month six. Um, whereas the other months have much fewer values that are any. So we would probably want to understand why do we only have about 10% um, or less of our values for that month. Okay. Um, so we saw yesterday how when we have any values, this can be problematic for mathematical operations. It's often going to give us an NA value in return, which is not super useful. Um, so this can happen with some mean, median, etc. Um, it can also cause um, other issues that we'll talk about in just a bit. When we look at logical values, uh, this is also true. And that's a really great thing because, and if you think about it, it makes sense. So if we're asking here for this vector of values, if we have values that are greater than two, we'll get an output that looks like this, where we have an NA value for the NA value. And that's because we don't really know what NA means. It could mean it was so big, it couldn't be recorded, or it was so small. So we have no idea whether it's greater than two or not. Um, and so it's nice that the output is NA and continues to be NA. All right, so filter has an interesting situation with NA values that you should be aware of. Um, when you're using filter, you're going to remove rows from data frames and values from vectors that are NA by default. So for example, in the vector that we were just looking at where we have one NA value, 
um, if we use filtering like this with our in operator, or if we used filtering with the filter function, in this case, um, it would make sense to use in because we're not, um, we don't have really anything to filter by in terms of variables, um, but we'll see that uh, this doesn't end up quite like we would hope because here we see a value of false for NA and we don't necessarily know what that NA is and it's probably best to keep that as an NA value. Um, and so one way to, to do these sorts of things is um, to add an or include is NA. Um, but mostly you're gonna be working with data frames. So we're gonna be um, mostly focusing on, on that. So this will be easier to see. That was a little hard, I think, in vector form. Um, but here we're looking at a data frame that has information about the number of dogs in a household and the number of cats in a household. And we can see that we're, we have some NA values. Um, and if we filter this entire data frame based on whether we have dog less than three, you'll see that we lose any row where dog is NA. So it's just something that you should be aware of. Um, otherwise, we could include something here to keep those. Um, with the is NA function. Um, if we wanted to filter out the NA values specifically and not other values, we would use the drop NA function. And this function is extremely useful for this um, because when we use the filter function uh, for actual NA values, that can, it doesn't necessarily always work. It can work sometimes for character vectors or variables, but sometimes you're gonna run into trouble with um, numeric. So the reason is because when you actually compare NA to itself, you're always going to get an NA value. So it's much better to use drop NA and avoid using filter to try to get specifically rid of um, NA values. Of course, if you wanted to filter for something else in addition, then you're gonna automatically drop them with filter. But in this case, we wanna keep all the values except for NA for dog. And so we can use drop NA for the dog variable. We can also use this across the entire data frame to remove any row that has any missing values. Um, so here we're seeing that we have NA values also for cat. And when we run drop NA, we remove all of the rows that have any NA value. And so now we only have two households left. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to point out that we need to be really careful about what NA values are, and we need to figure out what this actually means for our data. So, and to be careful about assuming what that means for our data. It could mean something like these values were so low that they weren't reported, but it could be something like they were so low that they weren't reported. And also it was when um, someone forgot to contact the patient again, for example. So you, you don't, necessarily know unless you contact the people that collected the data or you yourself collected the data. So definitely think carefully about any values. Sometimes you will have a situation where it does make sense to recode your NA values as a zero or something like that. Um, so for example, you might have a survey where you're looking at cigarette use by students and in fact, I had a survey that was like this. If, if a student had never tried a cigarette, uh, the value might be NA, but for cert students that were smokers, it would report a zero uh, for that week if they had not smoked a cigarette. And so in that case, um, if we wanted total information about how many cigarettes were smoked 
across all the students, whether they were smokers or non-smokers, then we might want to include those NA values as zeros. And, you know, we'd want the real sample size of students, of smokers and non-smokers. So that's something to keep in mind. So um, here you can see as a word of caution how we could get different results sometimes when we're doing calculations. So I've made a data set here called red blue where we have um, the count of values for each category and we have some NA values. And of course, if we decide to include every um, sample in our calculation of percent, which I'm doing here by using the mutate function, and I'm um, using the value in the column count uh, variable, and then I'm summing the vector for um, color count, uh, which is this column. I'm summing that column to get the numerator to divide uh, these values by to get the percentage. Of course, I would multiply this by 100, but um, here we can see that if we use the entire data set, including NA values, we'll get percentages that are like 30%. But if we decided to drop NA values, we'll get something like um, 50%. Um, we kind of want to ignore this one, but you can see that the values for what the percentage was for red and blue um, really changes from one context to another. So think about what you're doing with your data. Uh, one way to really assess this, which I think is great and, and quite simple also, is to use the count function, uh, because this not only gives us a sense of NA values, but it gives us the, a sense of how many, but also it gives us a sense of how many values we have for other um, other unique values for a given variable. For, so for example, here we're looking at the subtype uh, variable of the bike data set. And we can see that most of the uh, bike lanes are this subtype, um, but we only have one that's this subtype. And so those are times where you might wanna check, was that a typo? Is that a subtype that we care about? Um, and, you know, investigate our data and think about it further. So we're going to get in depth on this one particular thing because it can get a little bit tricky and I may have misspoken my lab slightly, but let's, let's talk about this. Um, okay, so ideally you wouldn't want a space here, but that's a typo. Here are a bunch of ways you might have tried to run um, looking at a particular value, or I'm sorry, variable from bike to see if it's percent complete. Amy had a question about this, and indeed you can run percent complete on the entire data frame, or you can run it on a uh, variable within the data frame. Um, but doing it in certain ways will not work. Um, so let's cover some of them. So uh, when we start when we do it in the base R way, which is kind of the most straightforward, we just put our, our dollar sign, um, that, that works pretty well. When we start mixing and matching dollar signs and piping, so if we did um, there's a bunch of ways we could try to do that. <laughs> there's so many variations. Not gonna like that. Uh, it doesn't like it whenever we combine um, piping and our dollar signs. So try not to mix those. Okay, so those things aside, let's start thinking about different ways that we could try to pipe this. We could first pull the subtype uh, vector from bike and try running percent complete, or you'll see from Ava, you could also use select. Um, we could try nesting it, and that should work. Uh, or we can run it sequentially as taking the bike data, pulling this particular variable, and then running the percent complete. Where we run into problems actually has to do with the order that we're doing things. So 
if we try to run bike and then percent complete by itself, that would work and would give us the amount complete on bike. But if we try to then pull from that the subtype um, variable, it won't work because what this is doing first is going to give us this output. So there's no variable to pull from anymore. So we can't pull subtype out of that. Um, similarly, if we tried to nest this and pull this from bike, we're going to have an issue as well. Um, so the order in which we do things is, is going to be pretty important. Um, I guess technically this, this option does work, but you can try to put this inside percent complete um, with pipes, which I think one of our, our lab members did and ran into issues. So generally just try avoiding using dollar signs and pipes together. Um, if you can, because those are technically two different syntaxes. So I like the way that Ava showed it, which was really clear and concise, but I wanted to give you all of these different jumbled versions. As you see, we could do it in about nine different ways, maybe more. Um, some of the ways work, some of them don't. And it has to do with thinking about what you're actually doing in each step. So most importantly, the reason this doesn't work is we're trying to pull, get percent complete on bike and then pull. And that order doesn't work because when we do percent complete, that step gives us one numeric value and we can no longer pull any variables out of that. Does that make sense? Are there any other questions about this? And I'll, I'll share in case you aren't on Slack. Let's see if I'm on the right channel. Yes. Um, Ava's really nice and clean, concise way. Can you see my Slack now? Or not? Maybe not. I, we could see it. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, you can see that, you know, if we, we can try selecting or pulling and then running percent complete, and that looks very nice. Um, but yeah, just because there are so many ways to do this particular thing and lots of other um, commands, there a bit of trial and error is, is gonna help you get used to what syntax will work. And occasionally, if it doesn't work, it's okay. Just think through it and Try, try rerunning it a little bit differently. Okay, let's get back to the lecture. I'm gonna try setting up everything so it's nice again. Okay, so that, that was a tricky, uh, topic. So um, thank you for, for bearing with us on that one. Um, we're going to get into another tricky, hopefully slightly more straightforward, we'll see, topic um, that's really important when you have messy data, and that's recoding variables. Okay, so first let's just start with some data that we're going to work with. Um, we're going to work with a data set that I've created about um, diet. So if you pulled the data from, um, if you pulled the actual RMD for our slides, you can see how I made this, but it's, it's basically using all the functions we talked about yesterday for making um, integer sequences. Um, but here we have, let's assume that we have a study where we have um, diet information. We have two different diets. We have a bunch of gender information. Um, we have the initial weight of the individual and a variable about weight change. So from the start date to the end date, what did their weight do? Okay, you may have noticed that there's something unusual about the gender variable here. 
which is that we have what appears to be some values coded in multiple ways. So we have male with a capital M, we have just a lowercase m, we have a capital M, we have man, um, we have female as a word, as a capital F, as a lowercase f, other as a word and just an O. So there's a lot going on with this that that's wrong and needs needs some recoding. This is kind of a, a silly example, it seems, but you might actually have a data set that's like this, where it's very, very long, and you don't realize that you have multiple codings for the same um, categorical variable. And so that's why it's really good to use the count um, function to take a look at your data and see how many different um, unique values you have for a variable. Okay, so dplyr has a really helpful function to help you with this, actually two that we'll discuss. If you tried to recode this in Excel and looked for every time you had an M, that's capital, this could be pretty tricky. You can't simply just uh, replace all capital M's. You'd have to go through each one because sometimes we have a capital M for man, and sometimes we just have a capital M, sometimes we have a capital M for male. So that would be a problem. Um, so instead, dplyr is a really great option here, and um, we're going to use this recode function. It's important to note that when you use recode, you're also going to need mutate. So how this general format works, and this is a bit tricky, so we're going to go slowly through it, is we take the data that we're working with, we use the mutate function to look at the variable, change the variable that we want to fix, so, or perhaps we're creating a new variable out of one that's recoded, um, but this is the new variable that we're creating or changing the variable that we're using to fix. And then this is kind of like we do have done with, with other functions. In this case, unlike rename where we have our new value and then our old value, here we're going to have our old value on the left and the new value on the right. And then you, know, you can have multiples of those. So when we look at this example down here, we're taking gender from diet data and we want to change gender so that we're recoding gender so that m will now become the character string male lowercase m the same man etc cetera, etc cetera. um it's we don't need quotation marks on these because they already exist in the data we need quotation marks on this side, on the right side, because this is what we're, we're wanting to recode to. Even though this does already technically exist in the data, whatever we're recoding to, we need to specify. Um, and then we can you know, use count gender diet to see if we're getting a similar count matrix or if we're going to simplify this, hopefully, and have fewer options. Um, and if you were to run this, indeed, you would see that you now just have male, female, and other. Um, so we're going to do some lab exercises working on that. Uh, I can try running through an example. Um, So I'm not sure exactly what we might want to recode. Let's do actually, this is too big of a data set. Let's work with um, Iris. So in Iris, we have some species here and say that I want to recode those species names. I would say that I wanna work with the Iris data and I want to mutate it so that the species variable is now recoded 
um, using these existing species variable so that set o Satosa is now equal to, if I wanted to, I could just do, I wanted to purchase it. Oops, I used read code did somewhere because I was describing it in words. Um, <laughs> and so now if I pipe this to head so that it's easier to see in my squished screen, um, we can see that now this is a capital S. So that's how this function works. We can also use a function called case win and this will do the same thing. This will accomplish the same um, task. And it will also do some fancier things as well. So it's, you really kind of just need re, um, case win. However, the difference between case win and recode is that recode is going to leave any value that you don't specify. So here you can see that when I showed the entire new data frame after running recode that virginica is still there if i were to use case win and i only specified that i'm changing satosa then virginica would automatically become an na value so you have to specify everything with case win um, so case win is really nice for making new variables based on recoding um, which we'll so show in a second but the case win format is relatively similar to the recode format. We're going to need our mutate function. And then again, just like we would with mutate, typically we're going to have the variable that we're creating or fixing, um, changing that is, because mutate is always for either creating a new variable or modifying a variable that's existing. And then we have our case win function uh, the variable that we're working with already and some sort of condition. And then we're going to start working with, this is called a tilde. Um, and that will basically point to the uh, new value for that condition, if the condition is met. So if this condition is true, then what value do we want for that? If the condition is not true, this will be an NA value or whatever subsequent conditions we specify. So um, someone had asked in the chat yesterday about tilde because we had some plot functions with tilde and when we get into statistics, you'll also see it. So tilde is used for um, formulas and it's also used for um, indicating the left and right side. So um, in our plot, we were putting the left side of the plot and the right, basically. Uh, so y axis and x. Um, but in here, we're talking about the left side of a condition doesn't meet a condition. And then the right side would be if it does, what would the value be? So it's a little bit different, but you can kind of think of it as um, an unusual equal sign. <laughs> Um, that has a, it's a fancier one, has a little more, it has to meet the condition or otherwise it'll be an NA value. So this will be clearer when I actually show an example. Okay, great. There's a question about when do we use the equal sign by itself versus the double equal sign? And that's a, a great question. We use the single equal sign when we have arguments um, or when we're working with uh, variables. We use the double equal sign when we're actually testing for equality. So when we're saying, is, the, is a value of this variable actually this particular character string? Um, so remember in filter, we use this when we're checking for equality, does a row equal this value? That's a really good question. So generally speaking, it's gonna be a single um, equal sign when we're talking about arguments or um, working with variables. So in terms of arguments, let's go back a little bit. 
just to show an example. I feel like we must have had an example. Yes. So here we had an argument facet and we used an equal sign. Um, we have lots of functions where we have arguments that we specify like na remove equals true. Um, but when we're actually looking at equality and asking whether the gender value equals, so it's sort of like if does this equal um, m. Okay, so now we're going to do a simple version of using this this uh, function. So we're just going to recode one thing. So we're looking at gender and we're um, using case win to mutate it. So we're going to change gender. And when gender is equal to the string capital M, we're going to recode it to be male. When it is not equal to exactly uppercase M, it will be a value of NA. And so when we look at the output, we see that indeed we have an NA value for everything except for where we had a capital M, which is now male. Um, I think we're almost to our break time. So perhaps we'll go through our more complicated version after we have a, a bit of time. And if you want, you can ponder and take a look at this for a bit um, and try to let it sink in. All right. Um, yeah, so there were some questions about this where we're not done with describing case when we're just unfortunately our break time kind of happened in the middle of that. So um, we'll we'll recap this and, and continue going a bit more in depth as well. Um, but so what case when does is it's very similar to recode, except instead of specifying something that it has to equal to, it'll also allow us to do other conditions. So the difference with recode is for recode, it has to be always essentially checking this condition. Does some, if something equals this, then change it to this. But for, for case when, we'll see in a second that it can be, when we have numeric values, it could be greater than or less than or something like that. But um, in this case, um, we're working with characters and we're, we're saying if it's equal to M, then change it to this character string. Otherwise, by default, everything else is going to get changed to NA. There is a way around this with um, using true. Um, so I'll, I'll show that here. I have some examples of, of things that you could do with Iris. In the iris data set, the species um, variable is actually a factor. And so you things are a little bit trickier with that. So I'll show that in a second. Um, but OK, here I have just showed you how to um, change the species variable so that when it is equal to lowercase Satosa, we're going to change it to a capital version of that. And so if we just look at iris without any of these modifications, we'll see that species is uh, lowercase. But when using case win, we can modify it. So anytime we have lowercase Satosa, it's going to be changed to uppercase. So here we have that I'll expand this a little bit that might help. Um, let's do slightly more. There we go. Now, if we um, look at tail, where we had other aspects of iris species, uh, we'll see that. Yeah, sorry about this warning message. I need to. Um, restart my R, but for now, just <laughs> see that species is now NA values. Um, and when we look at 
just the tail of iris without these changes, without using case when it's virginica. So we can see that we've lost it here. Um, that may be something that you want. Like maybe you only want to keep a particular value and make any, everything else NA, in which case case win is, is really useful. Um, you can get around this, like I said, um, which I, you can, I have it here somewhere. Here is an option for taking all the values that are not equal to Satosa, lowercase, and keeping them. And for that, you would use true and tilde, and you would say um, that you want to keep the original version of this variable. Uh, but because this variable is a factor, we need to keep it um, as character for this to work. So if I run this instead, we can see that we preserve Virginica, all the other variable names, um, sorry, variable values for species. Uh, and we keep, we still change Satosa to capital S. This is a little tricky now with this example. It's going to get easier with the examples that I have in the lecture. So, so let's go back to that. This is mostly, though, to point out to you that it works differently from Recode, and you will get NA values if you don't specify everything that uh, should be changed. So uh, here's a more complicated version, which is basically doing what we did with Recode, but it's a little bit easier to read in terms of um, you know, grouping by the variables that or the values that we want to create. So here's all the things that we would like to be coded as capital male, um, including male, because otherwise it will be NA. And um, same for female and same for our other um, values. And so now we can see that we've recoded this in a similar way to recode, which looked like this. So in this case, recode is a, is a good option, Pro possibly a better option than case win, unless you had a ton of things that you needed to recode, and then case win can be helpful. But case win is really helpful for more sophisticated comparisons. And so this will be a little more clear, I think, um, as to, to what case win is doing. So. I've decided to create a new um, a new variable called effect in our diet data. Uh, so if I scroll back to what our diet data looked like, oops. Um, you know, this is what our we have our diet, we have our gender information, we have the weight that the participants had at the start of the study, and then the weight change. And so we're interested in creating a new variable called effect, which has to do with the numeric values of weight change. So we can do several conditions according to the weight change variable. So if the case when and you can kind of read it out loud and it, it'll make a bit more sense. For the case when weight change variable is greater than zero, change this to increase or make this increase. Um, when it's exactly equal to zero, we want a value of same. And when it's less than zero, we want a value of decrease. So when we use a uh, case win like this for this data, we can see now down here that we have indeed created a new variable called effect. And for weight change values that are negative or less than zero, we see decrease. For greater than zero, we see increase. And for zero, we see the value same. Um, and this could be really good if we're trying to make tables uh, like this, where we want to, um, it's got cut off here, but where we wanted to see which groups did what, and we could make plots about, um, you know, 
which diet, we could better see which diet led to increases and decreases um, if we wanted to parse our data in that way. So that's the reason we might want to use case one. Yeah, if you again, if you want the diet data and you want to try practicing these, if you actually pull the RMD value from the sorry, the RMD document or the R document for the data cleaning um, lecture, you will see you can get the code to create that data and then test these out as well. OK, and then we're going to cover just a couple more simpler things, not quite as intensive as, as case win and um, also um, recode. But we will cover these, and then we'll, we'll try running some of these in, in our lab sessions, which will hopefully make things a little more obvious uh, about what's going on. OK, so what if we had data that looked like this, where we had counts and we had the diet information and whether it was a decrease or an increase. This would be kind of hard to work with. It would be really nice if we could separate out this first um, variable so that A, A and B for the diet information was separate from whether it was a decrease or an increase. So, there's a really well-named function called separate that can separate um, to a, a variable um, and create two new variables. So previously we had a lowercase variable called change and we want to separate that lowercase variable into two new variables. So we specify the variable we want to change and we specify with the into argument the names of the two new variables that we're creating. And so the left name will be on the left, the right name will be on the right. And so here we have our diet value and our, our change and they're nice and neatly separated. Um, we can do this in more complicated ways and, and specify what we want um, even more if we have a more, a more complicated um, situation. So I think my vector got eliminated here. I wanted to um, previously print this, but say you had a variable, assume for a second that this is one variable where we have a underscore diet and a space. If we wanted to separate a variable that looked like that so that we would have an output like this, we could, we could either separate by this underscore, which would not really be what we want, right? We'd have diet space decrease as our second variable and we would have AB as our first variable. So we can say that we wanna separate by a space here. Again, I apologize for I tried to make it easier by creating new new data for each each example, and I, I um, apparently didn't print it before. Okay, so uh, sometimes you might not want to separate, but actually unite. So this is basically the way of undoing separate. Or if you have variables that you want to combine together, you can use a function called unite, and so. Here's an example where we have a tibble, and in this case, you can try it out and you can undo it with separate if you'd like. So here we'll make this data frame so we can see it. Um, so we have some sort of clinical data set where we have patient IDs and visits. Um, and maybe we want to actually group that together so it's a little clear which visit we're looking at. Um, so we could use the unite function. Um, so we would say that we're working with our data frame. We're going to use the unite function. And we're specifying the new column name that we're making with the column argument which we're calling unique ID, but you could call it something else. So um, let visit 
ID this time. And then we're specifying the columns that we want to unite, which is ID and visit. and then how we want to separate it. So in the example in the lecture, we're separating by an underscore. Um, in this case, I'll do a dash to show how this works because um, we can use other forms of separators. So here we see now the output is with a dash in between. And then if we wanted to separate this, let's, um, make this into a new data frame called data frame united. So it looks like this. Now, when we want to try the separate function, do this in our tidyverse format. So we'll type it into separate. Um, will describe the column that we want to separate, which is visit ID, and into our new names, which will be ID visit. And R will automatically try to figure out what you're trying to separate by. And in this case, it knew that this is probably what we wanted to separate by, but it's a good idea in case you have complicated data to, um, to specify what your separator is, just in case there's some other aspect that R might try to separate by. So we're getting the same output here. It's just because I've, I've, um, I've said that we're separating by our dash. So that's how those functions work. And then we're just going to touch on the fact that there's some other aspects for modifying data called string functions for character strings. Um, there's a lot of extra slides in the slide deck if you want to take a look at those. Or you can check out open case studies, particularly the case studies about diet and obesity, if you're interested in learning more about this because you have data that's like that. Um, but not everyone necessarily needs this, so we're not going to go into great depth on this. Um, but the point is that we can actually split strings or replace them or find them, and we don't have to do exact um, matches for an entire value for a variable, we can actually just do partial things, which is what the stringer package is all about. So it's looking for the part of the character string or all. Um, and if you're familiar with other languages, you might have know about grep or g sub, and it's, it's similar to this. And base R actually has functions that are named exactly those things. Um, but if you're not familiar with that, don't worry about that. Just um, you know, learn about the stringer functions, which all start with str underscore, and then a word that's about what they're doing. So the most helpful functions that are mostly widely used are um, str detect, which looks for a pattern and tells you true if it's found or false if it's not found. Um, and str replace, which will find a pattern and then replace the pattern. So we'll show a couple of examples of that. So in the JHUR package, there's a data set called um, from read salary that we're going to call Sol. You could also download it from this link. And so if we take a look at Sol, if you're following along now, you'll see this. And I know that I didn't supply a lot of code for going through group by, sorry, case win and um, recode, but we're going to do a lot of that in our in our lab. And it's it's tricky, so it's helpful to have, have us there, I think. Um, 
But okay, so here we have our data and we have names of individuals, their title, um, the agency that they work at, when they got hired, their salary, et cetera. So we have a lot of string information, character information about the names and the title of the job that these people have. Um, if we want to just find values for people within last name Rawlings, this is a really useful thing to know. So we could use this code here to parse out people with the name Rawlings. So we're using our filter function and we're, we're nesting here for detecting for our name variable, something that looks like Rawlings. And so that's gonna reduce our rows to just the rows that have this name. We could do something else like Rawl, just a partial string. And we'll see that we'll get other names that are similar to Rawlings, but they're Rawlins and Rawls and Rawls with an E. Um, so it'll match just this part of the string and we'll get anything that um, is, is part of that match, uh, or it has at least that match, I should say. So this is really good if you're trying to look through your data for a particular value. Um, this can be extremely useful. The other thing that's useful is this str replace function, and there's also rest replace all. Um, we'll go through each of those separately. So let's say that we're looking at job titles, and here I've already just pulled job title from the SOL data set, and I'm just using head to look at the first six values. And here we can see a number of job titles like epidemiologist, police officer, et cetera. But let's say uh, there's something about the way this is coded that we don't like. We find it difficult to read these values. Um, so we want to recode anytime we see the value two as um, Roman numeral to be a numeric version. So we could actually use recode or case win and type in each potential thing that has the Roman numeral two in it, but that would be difficult and um, we could make an error. And this, this is a little simpler. So instead um, we can replace any time that we have the Roman numeral two with uh, the numeric two. So it's just um, the variable that you're working with, it likes vectors, so you need to use poll, what you're changing and what you're changing it to. Um, in comparison to this, replace all will replace every instance of a uh, character string. So we only have one Roman numeral two in every everything that I can see here. But say this is a silly example. But say there are some some um, component. Usually it's something like we want to get rid of all of our spaces and replace them with underscores. Um, we could do that using this function. So I'll do that now for our um, data here to show that. Um, so the difference here is that, so I'll try, I'll show two versions. So let's say that we want to, um, have to pull our, variable well, let's do job title actually so let's just take a look at that that's printing out all of our job titles and let's say that we don't like this is and we want to replace spaces. With underscores. 
So when I run this, I'm just using replace. We can see that we get the first space changed, but the subsequent spaces do not change. So replace, str replace is only going to look for the first instance. If we want to do all of them, we have to add all. And now we've replaced every value to be um, to be underscores. It's a space. Um, and so we could use this inside the mutate function if we wanted to change the job title uh, variable so that all of these were um, were underscores, which I propose to you as a challenge to try it to do on your own. Um, but we're going to move on to our lab and we're gonna go through some of this together now.